Hi friends, welcome back. I'm Christina, the manager at the Pacific Beach Library. Today is day four of our read along together of Emma by Jane Austen. Oh, it's a good day. We've got lots of fun stuff ahead of us. I'm so excited. Today's tea that I'm enjoying is a black tea with lemon flavor. Simple, classic, delicious. Um, I hope you're having something wonderful. I hope you're having a good day. Let's see. Oh, I did want to thank you. Hello. It's good to see you. Um, it's, I hope everyone has had a chance to already go in and vote on what film adaptation you'd like to see. You know, I probably should have added an option of I'm not interested in seeing a film. Um, just because now I'm not sure if people didn't get a chance to vote yet or if they are just meh, feeling meh about it. I hope you're not feeling meh about it. Um, if you're at all interested in watching an adaptation of Emma on the weekend after the 11th, so either in the 12th or the 13th, hello! Um, I see some excited eyes. That looks to me like not meh, yay! Um, <laughs> please go in and vote as to when you would like to watch a screening of Emma. I wasn't sure if um, our usual three o'clock time would still be good because I was hoping that maybe some of the people who are perhaps committed to the day and watched, you know, these viewings afterwards, if they might want to come in and watch the live screening, because when we watch the film, it'll only be available once. It, we're going to watch it together live is the idea, or we're going to watch it together as a group. The film is, of course, recorded. You know what I mean? Um, so and then the other question, there's a separate poll asking which film adaptation you'd like to see. And the last time I checked, by a far margin right now, we seem to be most interested in watching Emma, period. Um, the period piece that was filmed at, or sorry, that was uh, released in 2020, so just last year. So I think it's probably the one that has the best likelihood of, not, of us not having yet seen it. So that'll be fresh for all of us. But if there's one of the other versions you'd like to watch instead, either the 1996 Emma version with um, Gwyneth Paltrow, or if you wanted to watch the 1995 um, modern update of Emma in Clueless, that would also be great. So go ahead and vote as to what you'd like to see. Hmm. I see a comment that it doesn't really matter which one, and I can only see the beginning of that comment, and I hope it is that we will enjoy whichever one we watch together, which I think will be the case. But yeah, please do vote as to when would be the best time, because I really want this to be something we can do together. I think that'll be fun. And so, you know, the more people who can attend, that's the time we want to do. All right, so let's talk a bit about what happened in yesterday's two chapters of Emma. Um, where we had left off the previous day was that Emma had started to draw a portrait of Harriet Smith and that Mr. Elton, the vicar, had agreed to take it into London to get framed. And um, the, day, uh, the day that Mr. Elton goes to London, Harriet Smith comes to see Emma and she has had a rather momentous thing happen to her. She has by letter received a, a proposal of marriage from Mr. Robert Martin the farmer who lives on the or outside the estate of Mr. Knightley at the home where um, Harriet Smith had spent the summer before, just prior to meeting Emma. And um, it's actually a very nice letter. Emma's quite impressed by it and surprised because she had thought that Robert Martin being a farmer and rather of low birth, let's say, that he would be, you know, too uncouth and not able to have such a well-written well, well letter. And it's it's a funny chapter, chapter seven, because basically Harriet Smith is undecided at first about what she should say. So she consults her friend, Emma Woodhouse. And Emma basically says over and over again, oh, no, I'm not going to influence you. You do what you're going to do. You be you, girl. And then she just like slides in the knife and is like, but of course you're going to say no, right? It's really just a question of how you're going to say no. There's no way you'd say yes to that. I mean, he's a farmer. And so Emma's really dismissive of Robert's um, proposal. The more Emma says, the more Harriet, dis, you know, realizes or decides that you're, she's right. She should not be marrying Robert. What was she thinking? And ultimately, Emma helps um, Harriet to draft a letter declining the proposal of marriage. Again, all of the while, Emma saying, of course, this is not my decision. It's your decision. And I would never tell you what to do while she's pretty much telling Harriet what to do. Um, she also is saying that, you know, part of it is my selfishness. I wouldn't want to lose you. You're such a, bos a bosom friend of mine. And of course, if you were to marry a farmer like that, I would never see you again because he's so socially below me that by virtue of your marrying him, you are more socially below me and I just would have no association with you whatsoever after this. So yeah, Emma's a little not nice in that chapter. Um, although I'm sure she truly believes that she's doing well and trying to help her friend who she actually believes to be of a better social class than Robert Martin. Um, 
in chapter eight, Harriet spends the night at um, at Hartfield, um, the, fam the Woodhouse family estate. And then the next day she goes to Mrs. Goddard's, the boarding school where she'd been staying to, um, to see Mrs. Goddard. And she's gone for quite a while. And while she's gone, Mr. Knightley calls. And Mr. Knightley is, you know, has a nice chit chat with Emma and her father. Fun scene with the father. He is amusing. He goes out eventually. And Mr. Knightley and Emma talk just with each other. And Mr. Knightley reveals that he believes something good is going to happen to Harriet Smith soon. And in fact, the good thing that he believes is going to happen soon is a marriage proposal from Robert Martin, whom he knows very well because he lives next to um, Mr. Knightley's estate. And he quite esteems Mr. Martin as being one of the most sensible, kind, and, you know, good-natured young men. And Basically, Emma reveals that, well, actually, he already did propose. And of course, Harriet said no, because he's a farmer. And Mr. Knightley and Emma have a bit of a heated discussion, let's say, where Mr. Knightley basically says that truly, he feels that Emma's doing harm right now by meddling in this affair, that Harriet Smith, although beautiful and kind, is not very smart. And even though she is the illegitimate child of perhaps somebody, a gentleman who has enough money to send her to school, this gentleman is not willing to give her his name. She is, you know, so she's basically, she's a bastard, or would it be it for a daughter? Would that still be the right term? But, you know, she's of illegitimate birth. She doesn't have the... Um, she doesn't have claims to nobility or gentility. Um, she doesn't have like a set future ahead of her. And because she doesn't have enough, you know, intelligence and enough to recommend herself beyond that, just her, her social status is rather limited. And by Emma trying to tell her and convince her that she needs to aim higher, that she is better than the people around her, he is concerned, Mr. Knightley is concerned that Harriet is going to alienate the people who have been her, whom she has seen as her peers all her life, because now she feels that she is better, um, more along Emma's class, while the people in Emma's class are going to look down on her for being not very well educated and not of, of the similar birth as, as they. So he's basically saying Emma, by meddling the way she is, is isolating Harriet ultimately, and is going to hurt Harriet. And that if anything, Robert Martin, um, for being a farmer, he's an intelligent farmer. He's going to be a pretty well-off farmer. And it's like, if anything, he was marrying down by marrying Harriet. And it was because he, you know, he esteemed her, he loved her. And, you know, that is why Mr. Knightley advised him to go ahead and make the proposal, despite the concerns he had about Harriet Smith. So Emma was quite upset about this. She didn't like being brought to task. And, um, she, Mr. Knightley also sort of hints and surmises that he believes that perhaps Emma, who had said earlier in the book that she wanted to be a matchmaker, that maybe she's trying to make some other match for Harriet. And if he, if she thinks that Mr. Elton is that prospect for Harriet, then she's quite mistaken. And Mr. Knightley says that he has heard Mr. Elton say things to the men uh, when the ladies are not present that perhaps Emma's not aware of. And one of them is that Mr. Elton knows that he's an attractive young man and he knows that he has a decent job and he knows that he is an attractive marriage prospect and he wants money. And that there's some women that he, there's a family that he knows of with a bunch of daughters who have dowries and good money. And he's basically, he's not going to waste himself on somebody like Harriet Smith, who would bring nothing of monetary value to that wedding or to the marriage. And Emma basically just says, oh, no, you're completely wrong. I mean, she's beautiful. She's kind. What more would a man want? And um, they basically disagree on this. They cannot come to agreement on it. Eventually, Mr. Knightley is just so frustrated by Emma that he decides, he just says, good morning to you. And he rises and walks off abruptly. He was very vexed and disappointed. Um, Emma is concerned, too, that Harriet's taken a long time coming back. She thinks that maybe perhaps Robert Martin went over and asked her again in person. But fortunately, no, he did not. Um, Harriet was just engaged with Mrs. Goddard and hearing the gossip from one of the other teachers who said that they had seen Mr. Elton leaving town the other day. And he had said he was carrying something very precious. And, you know, that would be the portrait done by Emma of Harriet Smith. And just, you know, maybe had something to do with a lady. And so the the... What Emma takes from this story and that Harriet takes from the story is that perhaps Mr. Elton does have feelings for Harriet. We will see now. All right. Today, we're just going to read two chapters, chapter nine and 10 of Emma. 
Let's go see what happens next. All right. Chapter nine. Mr. Knightley might quarrel with her, but Emma could not quarrel with herself. He was so much displeased that it was longer than usual before he came to Hartfield again. And when they did meet, his grave looks showed that she was not forgiven. She was sorry, but could not repent. On the contrary, her plans and proceedings were more and more justified and endeared to her by the general appearances of the next few days. The picture, elegantly framed, came safely to hand soon after Mr. Elton's return, and being hung over the mantelpiece of the common sitting room, he got up to look at it and sighed out his half sentences of admiration just as he ought. And as for Harriet's feelings, they were visibly forming themselves into as strong and steady an attachment as her youth and sort of mind admitted. Emma was soon perfectly satisfied of Mr. Martin's being no otherwise remembered than as he furnished a contrast with Mr. Elton of the utmost advantage to the latter. Her views of improving her little friend's mind by a great deal of useful reading and conversation had never yet led to more than a few first chapters and the intention of going on tomorrow. It was much easier to chat than to study, much pleasanter to let her imagination range and work at Harriet's fortune than to be laboring to enlarge her comprehension or exercise it on sober facts. And the only literary pursuit which engaged Harriet at present, the only mental provision she was making for the evening of life, was the collecting and transcribing all the riddles of every sort that she could meet with into a thin quarto of hot pressed paper made up by her friend and ornamented with ciphers and trophies. In this age of literature, such collections on a very grand scale are not uncommon. Miss Nash, head teacher at Mrs. Goddard's, had written out at least 300, and Harriet, who had taken the first hint of it from her, hoped, with Mrs. Woodhouse's help, excuse me, with Miss Woodhouse's help, to get a great many more. Emma insisted with her invention, memory, and taste. And as Harriet wrote a very pretty hand, it was likely to be an arrangement of the first order in form as well as quantity. Mr. Woodhouse was almost as much interested in the business as the girls and tried very often to recollect something worth their putting in. So many clever riddles as there used to be when he was young. He wondered he could not remember them, but he hoped he should in time. And it always ended in Kitty a fair but frozen maid. His good friend Perry, too, whom he had spoken to on the subject, did not at present recollect anything of the riddle kind, but he had desired Perry to be upon the watch, and as he went about so much, something, he thought, might come from that quarter. It was by no means his daughter's wish that the intellects of Highbury in general should be put under requisition. Mr. Elton was the only one whose assistance she asked. He was invited to contribute any really good enigmas, charades, or conundrums that he might recollect, and she had the pleasure of seeing him most intently at work with his recollections, and at the same time, as she could perceive most earnestly, careful that nothing ungallant, nothing that did not breathe a compliment to the sex, should pass his lips. They owed to him their two or three politest puzzles, and the joy and exultation with which at last he recalled and rather sentimentally recited that well-known charade, my first doth affliction denote, which my second is destined to feel, and my whole is the best antidote, that affliction to soften and heal, made her quite sorry to acknowledge that they had transcribed it some pages ago already. Why will not you write one yourself for us, Mr. Elton, said she. That is the only security for its freshness, and nothing could be easier to you. Oh, no, he had never written, however, hardly ever, anything of the kind in his life. <laughs> the stupidest fellow. He was afraid not even Miss Woodhouse, he stopped a moment, or Miss Smith could inspire him. The very next day, however, produced some proof of inspiration. He called for a few moments just to leave a piece of paper on the table containing, as he said, a charade, which a friend of his had addressed to a young lady, the object of his admiration but which, from his manner, Emma was immediately convinced must be his own. I do not offer it for Miss Smith's collection, said he. Being my friends, I have no right to expose it in any degree to the public eye. But perhaps you may not dislike looking at it. 
The speech was more to Emma than to Harriet, which Emma could understand. There was deep consciousness about him, and he found it easier to meet her eye than her friend's. He was gone the next moment. After another moment's pause, take it, said Emma, smiling and pushing the paper towards Harriet. It is for you. Take your own. But Harriet was in a tremor and could not touch it. And Emma, never loath to be first, was obliged to examine it herself. To Miss, hmm, charade. My first displays the wealth and pomp of kings, lords of the earth, their luxury and ease. Another view of man my second brings, behold him there, the monarch of the kings. But ah, united what reverse we have, man's boasted power and freedom all are flown. Lord of the earth and sea, he bends a slave, and woman, lovely woman, reigns alone. Thy ready wit the word will soon supply, may its approval beam in that soft eye. She cast her eye over it, pondered, caught the meaning, read it through again to be quite certain and quite mistress of the lines, and then passing it to Harriet sat happily smiling and saying to herself, while Harriet was puzzling over the paper and all the confusion of hope and dullness, very well, Mr. Elton, very well indeed. I have read worse charades. Courtship, a very good hint. I give you credit for it. This is feeling your way. This is saying very plainly, pray, Miss Smith, give me leave to pay my addresses to you. Approve my charade and my intentions in the same glance. May its approval beam in that soft eye. Harriet, exactly. Soft is the very word for her eye. Of all epithets, the justice that could be given. Thy ready wit, the word will soon supply. Humph. Harriet's ready wit. All the better. A man must be very much in, lo in love indeed to describe her so. Ah, Mr. Knightley, I wish you had the benefit of this. I think this would convince you. For once in your life, you would be obliged to own yourself mistaken. An excellent charade indeed, and very much to the purpose. Things must come to a crisis soon now. She was obliged to break off from these very pleasant observations, which were otherwise of a sort to run into great length, by the eagerness of Harriet's wondering questions. What can it be, Miss Woodhouse? What can it be? I have not an idea. I cannot guess it in the least. What can it possibly be? Do try to find it out, Miss Woodhouse. Do help me. I never saw anything so hard. Is it Kingdom? I wonder who the friend was, and who could be the young lady? Do you think it is a good one? Can it be woman? And woman, lovely woman, reigns alone. Can it be Neptune? Behold him there, the monarch of the seas, or a trident, or a mermaid, or a shark. Oh no, shark is only one syllable. It must be very clever, or he would not have brought it. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, do you think we shall ever find it out? Mermaids and sharks? Nonsense. My dear Harriet, what are you thinking of? Where would be the use of his bringing us a charade made by a friend upon a mermaid or a shark? Give me the paper and listen. For Miss M, mm, read Miss Smith. My first displays the wealth and pomp of kings, lords of the earth, their luxury and ease. That is court. Another view of man my second brings, behold him there, the monarch of the seas. That is ship, plain as can be, now for the cream. But ah, united, courtship, you know? What reverse we have, man's boasted power and freedom all are flown. Lord of the earth and sea, he bends a slave, and woman, lovely woman, reigns alone. A very proper compliment, and then follows the application, which I think, my dear Harriet, you cannot find much difficulty in comprehending. Read it in comfort to yourself. There can be no doubt of its being written for you and to you.
Harriet could not long resist so delightful a persuasion. She read the concluding lines and was all a flutter and happiness. She could not speak, but she was not wanted to speak. It was enough for her to feel. Emma spoke for her. There is so pointed and so particular a meaning in this compliment, said she, that I cannot have a moment's doubt as to Mr. Elton's intentions. You are his object, and you will soon receive the completest proof of it. I thought it must be so. I thought I could not be so deceived, but now it is clear. The state of his mind is as clear and decided as my wishes on the subject have been ever since I knew you. Yes, Harriet, just so long have I been wanting the very circumstance to happen, which has happened. I could never tell whether an attachment between you and Mr. Elton were most desirable or most natural. Its probability and its eligibility have really so equaled each other. I am very happy. I, congrat I congratulate you, my dear Harriet, with all my heart. This is an attachment which a woman may well feel pride in creating. This is a connection which offers nothing but good. It will give you everything that you want. Consideration, independence, a proper home. It will fix you in the center of all your real friends, close to Hartfield and to me, and confirm our intimacy forever. This, Harriet, is an alliance which can never raise a blush in either of us. Dear Miss Woodhouse, and dear Miss Woodhouse, was all that Harriet, with many tender embraces, could articulate at first. But when they did arrive at something more like conversation, it was sufficiently clear to her friend that she saw, felt, anticipated, and remembered just as she ought. Mr. Elton's superiority had very ample acknowledgement. Whatever you say is always right, cried Harriet, and therefore I suppose and believe and hope it must be so, but otherwise I could not have imagined it. It is so much beyond anything I deserve. Mr. Elton, who might marry anybody, there cannot be two opinions about him. He is so very superior. Only think of those sweet verses to Miss, mm. dear me, how clever. Could it really be meant for me? I cannot make a question or listen to a question about that. It is a certainty. Receive it on my judgment. It is a sort of prologue to the play, a motto to the chapter, and will soon, excuse me, and will be soon followed by matter of fact prose. It is a sort of thing which nobody could have expected. I am sure a month ago I had no more idea myself. The strangest things do take place. When Miss Smith's and Mr. Elton's get acquainted, they do indeed. And really, it is strange. It is out of the common course that what is so evidently, so palpably desirable, what counts the prearrangement of other people should, sorry, what courts the prearrangements of other people should so immediately shape itself into the proper form. You and Mr. Elton are by situation called together. You belong to one another by every circumstance of your respective homes. Your marrying will be equal to the match at Randall's. There does seem to be a something in the air of Hartfield which gives love exactly the right direction and sends it into the very channel where it ought to flow. The course of true love never did run smooth. A Hartfield edition of Shakespeare would have a long note on that passage. That Mr. Elton should really be in love with me. Me, of all people, who did not know him to speak to him at Michaelmas. And he, the very handsomest man that ever was, and a man that everybody looks up to, quite like Mr. Knightley. His company so sought after that everybody says he need not eat a single meal by himself if he does not choose it, that he has more invitations than there are days in the week. And so excellent in the church. Miss Nash has put down all the texts he has ever preached from since he came to Highbury. Dear me, when I look back to the first time I saw him, how little did I think. The two abbots and I ran into the front room and peeped through the blind when we heard he was going by, and Miss Nash came and scolded us away and stayed to look through herself. However, she called me back presently and let me look too, which was very good-natured. And how beautiful we thought he looked. 
he was arm in arm with Mr. Cole. This is an alliance which, whoever, whatever your friends may be, must be agreeable to them, provided at least they have common sense, and we are not to be addressing our conduct to fools. If they are anxious to see you happily married, here is a man whose amiable character gives every assurance of it. If they wish to have you settled in the same country and circle which they have chosen to place you in, here it will be accomplished. And if their only object is that you should, in the common phrase, be well married, here is the comfortable fortune, the respectable establishment, the rise in the world which must satisfy them. Yes, very true. How nicely you talk. I love to hear you. You understand everything. You and Mr. Elton are one as clever as the other. This charade, if I had studied a twelve-month, I could never have made anything like it. I thought he meant to try his skill by his manner of declining it yesterday. I do think it is, without exception, the best charade I ever read. I never read one more to the purpose, certainly. It is as long again as almost all we have had before. I do not consider its length as particularly in its favor. Such things in general cannot be too short. Harriet was too intent on the lines to hear. The most satisfactory comparisons were rising in her mind. It is one thing, said she presently, her cheeks in a glow, to have very good sense in a common way, like everybody else, and if there is anything to say, to sit down and write a letter, and say just what you must, in a short way, and another to write verses and charades like this. Emma could not have desired a more spirited rejection of Mr. Martin's prose. Such sweet lines, continued Harriet, these two last. But how shall I ever be able to return the paper or say I have found it out? Oh, Miss Woodhouse, what can we do about that? Leave it to me. You do nothing. He will be here this evening, I dare say, and then I will give it him back and some nonsense or other will pass between us, and you shall not be committed. Your soft eyes shall choose their own time for beaming. Trust to me. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, what a pity that I must not write this beautiful charade into my book. I am sure I have not got one half so good. Leave out the last two lines, is there, and there, excuse me, leave out the last two lines, and there is no reason why you should not write it into your book. Oh, but those two lines are the best of all, granted, for private enjoyment and for private enjoyment keep them. They are not at all the less written, you know, because you divide them. The couplet does not cease to be, nor does its meaning change, but take it away and all appropriation ceases, and a very pretty gallant charade remains fit for any collection. Depend upon it, he would not like to have his charade slighted much better than his passion. A poet in love must be encouraged in both capacities or neither. Give me the book, I will write it down, and then there can be no possible reflection on you. Harriet submitted, though her mind could hardly separate the parts, so as to feel quite sure that her friend were not writing down a declaration of love. It seemed too precious an offering for any degree of publicity. I shall never let that book go out of my own hands, said she. Very well, replied Emma, a most natural feeling, and the longer it lasts, the better I shall be pleased. But here is my father coming. You will not object to my reading the charade to him. It will be giving him so much pleasure. He loves anything of that sort, and especially anything that pays woman a compliment. He has the tenderest spirit of gallantry towards us all. You must let me read it to him. Harriet looked grave. My dear Harriet, you must not refine too much upon this charade. You will betray your feelings improperly if you are too conscious and too quick, and appear to affix more meaning, or even quite all the meaning which may be affixed to it. Do not be overpowered by such a little tribute of admiration. If he had been anxious for secrecy, he would not have left the paper while I was by. But he rather pushed it towards me than towards you. Do not let us be too solemn on the business. He has encouragement enough to proceed without our sighing out our souls over this charade. 
Oh, no, I hope I shall not be ridiculous about it. Do as you please. Mr. Woodhouse came in and very soon led to the subject again by the, by the reoccurrence of his very frequent inquiry of, well, my dears, how does your book go on? Have you got anything fresh? Yes, Papa, we have something to read you, something quite fresh. A piece of paper was found on the table this morning, dropped, we suppose, by a fairy, containing a very pretty charade, and we have just copied it in. She read it to him, just as he liked to have anything read, slowly and distinctly, and two or three times over, with explanations of every part as she proceeded. And he was very much pleased and, as she had foreseen, especially struck with the complimentary conclusion. Aye, that's very just indeed. That's very properly said. Very true. Woman, lovely woman. It is such a pretty charade, my dear, that I can easily guess what fairy brought it. Nobody could have written so prettily but you, Emma. Emma only nodded and smiled. After a little thinking and a very tender sigh, he added, Ah, it is no difficulty to see who you take after. Your dear mother was so clever at all those things. If I had but her memory, but I can remember nothing, not even that particular riddle which you have heard me mention. I can only recollect the first stanza, and there are several. Kitty, a fair but frozen maid, kindled a flame I yet deplore. The hoodwinked boy I called to aid, though of his near approach afraid, so fatal to my suit before. And that is all I can recollect of it, but it is very clever all the way through. But I think, my dear, you said you had got it. Yes, Papa, it is written out in our second page. We copied it from the elegant extracts. It was Garrick's, you know. Aye, very true. I wish I could recollect more of it. Kitty, a fair but frozen maid. The name makes me think of poor Isabella, for she was very near being christened Catherine after her grandmama. I hope I shall have her here next week. Have you thought, my dear, where you shall put her, and what room there will be for the children? Oh, yes. She will have her own room, of course, the room she always has, and there is the nursery for the children, just as usual, you know. Why should there be any change? I do not know, my dear, but it is so long since she was here, not since last Easter, and then only for a few days. Mr. John Knightley's being a lawyer is very inconvenient. Poor Isabella, she has sadly taken away from us all. And how sorry she will be when she comes not to see Miss Taylor here. She will not be surprised, Papa, at least. I do not know, my dear. I am sure I was very much surprised when I first heard she was going to be married. We must ask Mr. and Mrs. Weston to dine with us while Isabella is here. Yes, my dear, if there is time, but in a very depressed tone, she is coming for only one week. There will not be time for anything. It is unfortunate that they cannot stay longer, but it seems a case of necessity. Mr. John Knightley must be in town again on the 28th, and we ought to be thankful, Papa, that we are to have the whole of the time they can give to the country, that two or three days are not to be taken out for the Abbey. Mr. Knightley promises to give up his claim this Christmas, though you know it is longer since they were with him than with us. It would be very hard indeed, my dear, if poor Isabella were to be anywhere but at Hartfield. Mr. Woodhouse could never allow for Mr. Knightley's claims on his brother, or anybody's claims on Isabella, except his own. He sat musing a little while and then said, But I do not see why poor Isabella should be obliged to go back so soon though he does. I think, Emma, I shall try and persuade her to stay longer with us. She and the children might stay very well. Ah, Papa, that is, that is what you never have been able to accomplish, and I do not think you ever will. Isabella cannot bear to stay behind her husband. 
This was too true for contradiction. Unwelcome as it was, Mr. Woodhouse could only give a submissive sigh, and as Emma saw his spirits affected by the idea of his daughter's attachment to her husband, she immediately led to such a branch of the subject as must raise them. Harriet must give us as much of her company as she can while my brother and sister are here. I am sure she will be pleased with the children. We are very proud of the children, are we not, Papa? I wonder which she will think the handsomest, Henry or John. Ay, I wonder which she will. Poor little dears, how glad they will be to come. They are very fond of being at Hartfield, Harriet. I dare say they are, sir. I am sure I do not know who is not. Henry is a fine boy, but John is very like his mamma. Henry is the eldest. He was named after me, not after his father. John the second is named after his father. Some people are surprised, I believe, that the eldest was not, but Isabella would have called him Henry, which I thought very pretty of her. And he is a very clever boy indeed. They are all remarkably clever, and they have so many pretty ways. They will come and stand by my chair and say, Grandpapa, can you give me a bit of string? And once Henry asked me for a knife, but I told him knives were only made for grandpapas. I think their father is too rough with them very often. He appears rough to you, said Emma, because you are so very gentle yourself. But if you could compare him with other papas, you would not think him rough. He wishes his boys to be active and hardy, and if they misbehave, can give them a sharp word now and then. But he is an affectionate father. Certainly, Mr. John Knightley is an affectionate father. The children are all fond of him. And then their uncle comes in and tosses them up to the ceiling in a very frightful way. But they like it, Papa. There is nothing they like so much. It is such enjoyment to them that if their uncle did not lay down the rule of their taking turns, whichever began would never give way to the other. Well, I cannot understand it. That is the case with us all, Papa. One half of the world cannot understand the pleasures of the other. Later in the morning, and just as the girls were going to separate in preparation for the regular four o'clock dinner, the hero of this inimitable charade walked in again. Harriet turned away, but Emma could receive him with the usual smile, and her quick eye soon discerned in his the consciousness of having made a push, of having thrown a die, and she imagined he was come to see how it might turn up. His ostensible reason, however, was to ask whether Mr. Woodhouse's party could be made up in the evening without him, or whether he should be in the smallest degree necessary at Hartfield. If he were, everything else must give way. But otherwise, his friend Cole had been saying so much about his dining with him, had made such a point of it, that he had promised him conditionally to come. Emma thanked him, but could not allow of his disappointing his friend on their account. Her father was sure of his rubber. He... He re-urged, she re-declined, and he seemed then about to make his bow. When taking the paper from the table, she returned it. Oh, here's the charade you were so obliging as to leave with us. Thank you for the sight of it. We admired it so much that I have ventured to write it into Miss Smith's, Miss Smith's collection. Your friend will not take it amiss, I hope. Of course, I have not transcribed beyond the first eight lines. Mr. Elton certainly did not very well know what to say. He looked rather doubtingly, rather confused, said something about honor, glanced at Emma and at Harriet, and then seeing the book open on the table, took it up and examined it very attentively. With the view of passing off an awkward moment, Emma smilingly said, you must make my apologies to your friend, but so good a charade must not be confined to one or two. He may be sure of every woman's approbation when he writes with such gallantry. I have no hesitation in saying, replied Mr. El Mr. Elton, though hesitating a good deal while he spoke, excuse me, while he spoke. I have no hesitation in saying, at least if my friend feels at all as I do, I have not the smallest doubt that could he see his little effusion honored as I see it, looking at the book again and replacing it on the table, he would consider it as the proudest moment of his life. 
After this speech he was gone as soon as possible. Emma could not think it too soon, for with all his good and agreeable qualities, there was a sort of parade in his speeches which was very apt to incline her to laugh. She ran away to indulge the inclination, leaving the tender and the sublime of pleasure to Harriet's share. And now chapter 10. Though now the middle of December, there had yet been no weather to prevent the young ladies from tolerably regular exercise. And on the morrow, Emma had a charitable visit to pay to a poor sick family who lived a little way out of Highbury. Their road to this detached cottage was down Vicarage Lane, a lane leading at right angles from the broad, though irregular, main street of the place, and as may be inferred, containing the blessed abode of Mr. Elton. A few inferior dwellings were first to be passed, and then, about a quarter of a mile down the lane, rose the vicarage, an old and not very good house, almost as close to the road as it could be. It had no advantage of situation, but had been very smart, excuse me, but had been very much smartened up by the present proprietor, and such as it was, there could be no possibility of the two friends passing it without a slackened pace and observing eyes. Emma's remark was, there it is. There go you and your riddle book one of these days. Harriet's was, oh, what a sweet house. How very beautiful. The, there are the yellow curtains that Miss Nash admires so much. I do not often walk this way now, said Emma as they proceeded, but then there will be an inducement and I shall gradually get in intimately acquainted with all the hedges, gates, pools, and pollards of this part of Highbury. Harriet, she found, had never in her life been within been within side the vicarage, and her curiosity to see it was so extreme that considering exteriors and probabilities, Emma could only class it as a proof of love, with Mr. Elton's seeing ready wit in her. I wish we could contrive it, said she, but I cannot think of any tolerable pretense for going in. No servant that I want to inquire about his housekeeper, no message from my father. She pondered, but could think of nothing. After a mutual silence of some minutes, Harriet thus began again. I do so wonder, Miss Woodhouse, that you should not be married or going to be married. So charming as you are. Emma laughed and replied, My being charming, Harriet, is not quite enough to induce me to marry. I must find other people charming, one other person at least. And I am not only not going to be married at present, but have very little intention of ever marrying at all. Ah, so you say, but I cannot believe it. I must see somebody very superior to anyone I have seen yet to be tempted. Mr. Elton, you know, recollecting herself, is out of the question, and I do not wish to see any such person. I would rather not be tempted. I cannot really change for the better. If I were to marry, I must expect to repent it. Dear me, it is so odd to hear a woman talk so. I have none of the usual inducements of women to marry. Were I to fall in love, indeed, it would be a different thing. But I never have been in love. It is not my way or my nature, and I do not think I ever shall. And without love, I am sure I should be a fool to change such a situation as mine. Fortune, I do not want. Employment, I do not want. Consequence, I do not want. I believe few married women are half as much mistress of their husband's house as I am of Hartfield, and never, never could I expect to be so truly beloved and important as always first and always right in any man's eyes as I am in my father's. But then, to be an old maid at last, like Miss Bates. That is as formidable an image as you could present, Harriet, and if I thought I should ever be like Miss Bates so silly, so satisfied, so smiling, so prosing, so undistinguishing and unfastidious, and so apt to tell everything relative to everybody about me, I would marry tomorrow. But between us, I am convinced that there, I am convinced there never can be any likeness except in being unmarried. But still, you will be an old maid, and that's so dreadful. Never mind, Harriet. I shall not be a poor old maid, and it is poverty only which makes which makes celibacy contemptible to a generous pub. Let me try again. 
Never mind, Harriet, I shall not be a poor old maid, and it is poverty only which makes celibacy contemptible to a generous public. A single woman with a very narrow income must be a ridiculous, disagreeable old maid, the proper sport of boys and girls. But a single woman of good fortune is always respectable and may be as sensible and pleasant as anybody else. And the distinction is not quite so much against the candor and common sense of the world as appears at first, for a very narrow income has a tendency to contract the mind and sour the temper. Those who can barely live and who live perforce in a very small and generally very inferior society may well be illiberal and cross. This does not apply, however, to Miss Bates. She is only too good-natured and too silly to suit me. But in general, she is very much to the taste of everybody, though single and though poor. Poverty certainly has not contracted her mind. I really believe if she had only a shilling in the world, she would be very likely to give away sixpence of it, and nobody is afraid of her. That is a great charm. Dear me, but what shall you do? How shall you employ yourself when you grow old? If I know myself, Harriet, mine is an active, busy mind with a great many independent resources. And I do not perceive why I should, excuse me, and I do not perceive why I should be more in want of employment at 40 or 50 than one and 20. Woman's most Excuse me. Woman's usual occupations of eye and hand and mind will be as open to me then as they are now, or with no important variation. If I draw less, I shall read more. If I give up music, I shall take to carpet work. And as for objects of interest, objects for the affections, which is in truth the great point of inferiority, the want of which is really the great evil to be avoided in not marrying, I shall be very well off with all the children of a sister I love so much to care about. There will be enough of them in all probability to supply every sort of sensation that declining life can need. There will be enough for every hope and every fear, and though my attachment to none can equal that of a parent, it suits my ideas of comfort better than what is warmer and blinder. My nephews and nieces, I shall often have a niece with me. Do you know Miss Bates' niece? That is, I know you must have seen her a hundred times, but are you acquainted? Oh, yes, we are always forced to be acquainted whenever she comes to Highbury. By the by, that is almost enough to put one out of conceit with a niece. Heaven forbid, at least, that I should ever bore people half so much about all the nightlies together as she does about Jane Fairfax. One is sick of the very name of Jane Fairfax. Every letter from her is read 40 times over. Her compliments to all friends go round and round again. And if she does but send her aunt the pattern of a stomacher or knit a pair of garters for her grandmother, one hears of nothing else for a month. I wish Jane, Fa Jane Fairfax very well, but she tires me to death. They were now approaching the cottage and all idle topics were superseded. Emma was very compassionate, and the distresses of the poor were as sure of relief from her personal attention and kindness, her counsel and her patience, as from her purse. She understood their ways, could allow for their ignorance and their temptations, had no romantic expectations of extraordinary virtue from those for whom education had done so little, entered into their troubles with ready sympathy, and always gave her assistance with as much intelligence as goodwill. In the present instance, it was sickness and poverty together which she came to visit, and after remaining there as long as she could give comfort or advice, she quitted the cottage with such an impression of the scene as made her say to Harriet as they walked away, These are the sights, Harriet, to do one good. How trifling they make everything else appear. I feel now as if I could think of nothing but these poor creatures all the rest of the day, and yet... Who can say how soon it may all vanish from my mind? Very true, said Harriet. Poor creatures, one can think of nothing else. And really, I do not think the impression will soon be over, said Emma as she crossed the low hedge and tottering footstep which ended the narrow slippery path through the cottage garden and brought them into the lane again. I do not think it will, stopping to look once more at all the outward wretchedness of the place and recall the still greater within. Oh, dear no, said her companion. 
They walked on. The lane made a slight bend, and when the bend was passed, Mr. Elton was immediately in sight, and so near as to give Emma time only to say farther, Ah, Harriet, here comes a very sudden trial of our stability and good thoughts. Well, smiling, I hope it may be allowed that if compassion has produced exertion and relief to the sufferers, it has done all that is truly important. If we feel for the wretched enough to do all we can for them, the rest is empty sympathy, only distressing to ourselves. Harriet could just answer, Oh, dear, yes, before the gentleman joined them. The wants and sufferings of the poor family, however, were the first subject on meeting. He had been going to call on them. His, his visit he would now defer, but they had a very interesting parley about what could be done and should be done. Mr. Elton then turned back to accompany them. To fall in with each other on such an errand as this, thought Emma, to meet in a charitable scheme, this will bring a great increase of love on each side. I should not wonder if it were to bring on the declaration. It must, if I were not here. I wish I were anywhere else. Anxious to separate herself from them as far as she could, she soon afterwards took possession of a narrow footpath a little raised on one side of the lane, leaving them together in the main road. But she had not been there two minutes when she found that Harriet's habits of dependence and imitation were bringing her up too, and that, in short, they would both be soon after her. This would not do. She immediately stopped under pretense of having some alteration to make in the lacing of her half-boot, and stooping down in complete occupation of the footpath, footpath begged them to have the goodness to walk on, and she would follow in half a minute. They did as they were desired, and by the time she judged it reasonable to have done with her boot, she had the comfort of further delay in her power, being overtaken by a child from the cottage, setting out, according to orders with her pitcher, to fetch broth from Hartfield. To walk by the side of this child, to talk and question her, was the most natural thing in the world, or would have been the most natural had she been acting just then without design. And by this means, the others were still able to keep ahead without any obligation of waiting for her. She gained on them, however, involuntarily. The child's pace was quick and theirs rather slow, and she was the more concerned at it from their being evidently in a conversation which interested them. Mr. Elton was speaking with animation, Harriet listening with a very pleased attention. And Emma, having sent the child on, was beginning to think how she might draw back a little more when they both looked around, and she was obliged to join them. Mr. Elton was still talking, still engaged in some interesting detail, and Emma experienced some disappointment when she found that he was only giving his fair companion an account of the yesterday's party at his friend Cole's, and that she was come in herself for the Stilton cheese, the North Wiltshire, the butter, the celery, the beetroot, and all the dessert. This would soon have led to something better, of course, was her consoling reflection. Anything interests between those who love, and anything will serve as introduction to what is near the heart. If I could have, if I could but have kept longer away. They now walked on together quietly till within view of the vicarage pales, when a sudden resolution of at least getting Harriet into the house made her again find something very much amiss about her boot and fall behind to arrange it once more. She then broke the lace off short and dexterously throwing it into a ditch was presently obliged to entreat them to stop and acknowledge her inability to put herself to rights so as to be able to walk home in tolerable comfort. Part of my lace is gone, said she, and I do not know how I am to contrive. I really am a most troublesome companion to you both, but I hope I am not often so ill-equipped. Mr. Elton, I must beg leave to stop at your house and ask your housekeeper for a bit of ribbon or string or anything just to keep my boot on. Mr. Elton looked all happiness at this proposition, and nothing could exceed his alertness and attention in conducting them into his house and endeavoring to make everything appear to advantage. The room they were taken into was the one he chiefly occupied, and looking forwards, behind it was another with which it immediately communicated, the door between them was open, and Emma passed into it with the housekeeper to receive her assistance in the most comfortable manner. She was obliged to leave the door ajar as she found it, but she fully intended that Mr. Elton should close it. 
It was not closed, however. It still remained ajar. But by engaging the housekeeper in incessant conversation, she hoped to make it practicable for him to choose his own subject in the adjoining room. For ten minutes, she could hear nothing but herself. It could be protracted no longer. She was then obliged to be finished and make her appearance. The lovers were standing together at one side of the windows. It had a most favorable aspect, and for half a minute, Emma felt the glory of having schemed successfully. But it would not do. He had not come to the point. He had been most agreeable, most delightful. He had told Harriet that he had seen them go by and had purposely followed them. Other little gallantries and allusions had been dropped, but nothing serious. Cautious, very cautious, thought Emma. He advances inch by inch and will hazard nothing till he believes himself secure. Still, however, though everything had not been accomplished by her ingenious device, she could not but flatter herself that it had been the occasion of much present enjoyment to both and must be leading them forward to the great event. Well, we'll see what kind of great events we reach next or we discover next week when we continue our read along together of Emma by Jane Austen. And in the meantime, I entreat you one more time to please go ahead and vote um, both on when you would like to watch a film together and also which film you might like to watch together. I will um, be closing that poll on Monday so that I have time to make arrangements with the, with the licensing company for the films and Let's we'll start getting that planned while we continue our read along together of Emma. So thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. This time it really is Thursday. I do know my days of the week today, unlike yesterday. So this time I mean it when I say I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I will see you again next Monday for more read along together of Emma. <laughs> Bye, friends.